announcements for the life of the church, and then we'll get up and we'll pass the students. I'm going to point out that you'll find out in the front hall, in the back hall, and all over the place, posters for our Mardi Gras event, which is in two Tuesdays. And Sue is going to kind of orchestrate our cooking. We have a couple of volunteers who are going to help with chopping, but she had the idea that maybe next Sunday, we would do a chopping party at the church. So if you feel like staying for five or ten minutes, it probably won't take very long to slice and dice because we've got a one-armed master chef here. <laughs> um, some other hands, plan on a, well, we probably have enough aprons or whatever is covering you. We're bringing an apron and then I'm having a cut so, party. So what do I do with the ten pounds of shrimp I just bought? Oh, oh. oh. y'all get to eat it. Chopping party next week, the 23rd. Tuesday, February 25th is Fat Tuesday. Starts at 6 o'clock. The Kennett High School Jazz Ensemble is going to play for us as well as some tickets. So you know it's going to be tasty. And if, if you need like really fancy jazz, Heather Pearson is playing over at the Stone Mountain Arts <coughs> in Denmark, Maine. Um, she, she was wishing she could clone herself and be both places because she was with us last year and it was great. But we always have fun, we always have tasty food. So come deck out and plan to celebrate the last day before Lent. And if you want to do the cooking, so that's Monday. So if you want to do the Mohammed's cooking, you're more than welcome to play. Okay, so we'll announce uh, hours for cooking on Monday. So cutting Sunday, cooking Monday, eating on Tuesday. We're also going to start a Lenten Bible series, a, a Bible study series, the first Tuesday of March, which I'm going to get the date wrong, so I'm not even going to guess. I think it's March 5th or 6th. We're, we're going to switch locations, so we'll keep that, keep you posted, but we're going to be reading Max Lucado's um, book about Jesus. So if you're looking for a Lenten series, that's the one that we're going to be focusing on. Any other announcements for the life of the church right now? Oh, I'll just in the bulletin, I'll call your attention to the annual Protestant Chapel Association meeting, which is not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow at 5 o'clock uh, upstairs in the Bay um, Whitney Library. Okay, so it should be a short meeting because there's nothing more controversial this year, which oh, maybe that'll make you come, maybe that'll make you.
and then we get to our song. First of all, welcome to Jackson Community Church. And I want to say a special welcome again to our guest soloist this morning, Alyssa LaChapelle, who will be singing a, a version of the Lord's Prayer that was composed by Alan. We got to hear this once, we're going to get to hear it twice today because it is part of our reflection. We'll hear it earlier in the service. In lieu of saying the words of the Lord's Prayer, you're going to hear the Lord's Prayer sung to you. And then we'll hear it again later. Please rise if you're able for the first song of the morning. Holy, 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 Lord God, I love you. and saying, I'm sorry, as a form of prayer. 
we begin this morning's prayers with people by asking for any prayers that you wish to have lifted up out loud. And I know that we have one, so Deanna, if you want to share one of them. So, Deanna's future sister-in-law, her name is Teresa, and she has been living with and is now living through to the end of her life with cancer. And so, for the time that she may have here on earth, for those who love her, and for the dignity and comfort of her journey, and for the home that she may find beyond this life, and the love that she may find while she is here in this life, we raise up prayers for Teresa. Other prayers. Prayers for uh, the family that just endured a five alarm fire down in Conway and for the first responders that will have been part of that experience. We hold all of them in our prayers, not knowing yet what the outcome may have been. Kevin? Um, for Reverend Gail, Pastor Nathan, Pastor Cynthia, Pastor Ruth, Pastor Sean. And um, Pastor Sue, pray for all of them because they hold the community together. And um, um, pray for my friend Grace at work who wrote her arm. And pray for Suzanne. And pray for Aunt and Ella that she has just good help. And um, uh, and. Uh, I'll be fine. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so Kevin prays for many of the ministers in the valley, but let us extend that to all the clergy leaders and spiritual leaders of this valley in the many different roles that they serve. Um, and for many of Kevin's friends who need one form of healing or another. Other prayers? So for our friend Seal, who's a beloved member of this community and her ongoing journey with cancer, and we broaden that prayer because there is not one person in this room who has not been touched in one way or another by cancer. And so for those who are living with that diagnosis, for those who are in long-term remission, for those who have lost somebody to cancer, for those who are caregivers, a journey with others in this experience, and for those who are on the forefront of research and caregiving to create new solutions and answers and forms of treatment. For each life that is touched by cancer, for the bodies that need healing, for the cells that need to be healthy and not unhealthy, for the end of growth that is the wrong kind of growth, we ask for healing. We ask also for healing for other kinds of challenges to our bodies, for people that are living with suicidality, depression, and mental health challenges that make it hard for them to either stay in this world or to function well in this world and participate fully in their own well-being for our own joints and bones and muscles, for our minds and our hearts and our hips and our knees and our wrists and all the parts of us, our spines. There are just so many aches and pains and hurting parts that are at risk right now. Um, a lot of people that need true healing. Other curves. Prayers of joy. Anybody have some of those? Thank <laughs> you. 
We give gratitude for horses and cats and dogs and all the pets and animals that help us through our daily living and call attention to the bigger world. And we give thanks for the things that give us joy, mostly each other's stories. Hear now our silence. We ask that you will help us now to listen. As the words of the Lord's Prayer are sung out to us with creativity and joy. Do not be angry with me forever or store up evil for me. Do not condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O Lord, are the God of those who repent. And in me you will manifest your goodness. For unworthy as I am, you will save me according to your great mercy. And I will praise you continually all the days of my life. For all the hosts of heaven sings your praise. And yours is the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This passage is from Desmond Tutu. Um, it's entitled, I am sorry, the three hardest words to say. A human life is a great mixture of goodness, beauty, cruelty, heartbreak, indifference, love, and so much more. All of us share the core qualities of our human nature, and so sometimes we are generous and sometimes selfish. Sometimes we are thoughtful and other times thoughtless. Sometimes we are kind and sometimes cruel. This is not a belief, this is a fact. No one is born a liar or a rapist or a terrorist. No one is born full of hatred. No one is born full of violence. No one is born in any less glory or goodness than you or me. But on any given day, in any given situation, in any painful life experience,
His glory and goodness can be forgotten, obscured, or lost. We can easily be hurt and broken. And it is good to remember that we can just as easily be the ones who have done the hurting and the breaking. The simple truth is we all make mistakes and we all need forgiveness. There is no magic wand we can wave to go back in time and change what has happened or undo the harm that has been done. But we can do everything in our power to set right what has been made wrong. We can endeavor to make sure the harm never happens again. There are times when all of us have been thoughtless, selfish, or cruel. But no act is unforgivable. No person is beyond redemption. Yet it is not easy to admit one's wrongdoing and ask forgiveness. I am sorry are perhaps the three hardest words to say. We can come up with all manner of justifications to excuse what we have done. When we are willing to let down our defenses and look honestly at our actions, we find there is a great freedom in asking for forgiveness and great strength in admitting the wrong. It is how we free ourselves from our past errors. It is how we are able to move forward into our future, unfettered by the mistakes we have made. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to remind you that although we have a hiatus with the youth group and the musical service last week, we have been working on the four sentences that might be the wisdom as presented to us by Detective Gamache, the fictional character from Louise Penny's Detective series. And the four sentences are, I don't know, I need help, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Today is the last of those four sentences. And interestingly, when you look up I'm sorry in the scripture, a lot of it is actually God regretting that God made humankind. I'm sorry I made those humans. And then God relents and loves us anyway. And really the language of I'm sorry in the Bible comes as the language of confession, the language of saying, I confess that I did something wrong. So when we use the word trespasses or when we use the word sin, if that's not a comfortable or familiar word to you, think of it in the context of a good form of I'm sorry. I'm sorry is an easy word to say, but it's only meaningful when it comes with accountability, full acknowledgement of the hurt you may have given someone else, a plan that it won't happen again, as we heard Desmond Tutu say, and, and taking responsibility for what has happened, what has transpired. If you just say, I'm sorry, I'm oh, my bad, I'm sorry, and walk away, it means little or nothing. It is in the making amends, truly, seeking forgiveness if you're able to seek forgiveness, but taking responsibility and trying to change things so that this mistake or this way of being harmful to another person isn't repeated to the best of your ability. In this valley, there are agencies that work together, right? They hold human life in their hands. So they are less than perfect, but they are sometimes the safety net for other people. And the Waste Station, which you guys know is our big resource center for the homeless, has helped over 100 people at this point since it opened in June. One day last month, we counted 93 homeless in our county, just in one day. And sometimes people are still living in tents. And last week, we had a very serious situation with an older gentleman whose mental health did not allow him to cooperate in his own well-being, and we were trying to get him help. And we had two agencies that are critical to making that happen who were having a conflict of the personalities. People had got really upset with each other, there was miscommunication, 
and they started refusing to call each other, speak to each other, or include each other in emails that were being passed around over a course of days to try to get this person out of the woods, out of the tent, before the next freezing weather or blizzard happened. The incapacity to, to make peace, to make amends, or to right the relationship was starting to affect their ability to actually save someone's life. A life was literally at stake. And I want to come back to that story. I also want us to think about another woman who was meditating on the Lord's Prayer. Because within the Lord's Prayer is embedded that sentence, forgive my trespasses or forgive my sins as I forgive those who have sinned against me. And that sounds like an easy recipe, but Desmond Tutu would tell you it's not easy. That forgiveness is a journey and a process. And that sometimes we never get the I'm sorry or the apology from another person, the perpetrator of harm to us. That sometimes the person on the other side of the hurting must relinquish what they are carrying, the hatred or the, the harm, the anger of another person simply to release themselves from continuing to receive that hurt. In particular, the story of Immaculate Il Gabizi, Gabiza, who wrote a book called Love to Tell, is a famous story at this point. In 1994, she was an electrical engineering student when the Rwandan genocide happened. She happened to be home. Her brother woke her up and told her that the president had been killed. And then he started people, seeing people in the fields with machetes. She ran to her father's house. She was a Tutsi woman. She was on the receiving end of violence, and her father sent her fleeing to a Hutu minister's house. She lived in a bathroom that was a three-by-four room with nine other women for 91 days, hidden in his house, while people prowled the village throughout that time, looking for those that they knew were hidden or who had escaped violence because they wanted to kill one more person. 800,000 to a million people were killed in just 100 days. She took into the bathroom with her rosary beads and a Bible. And one of the things that she did was over that course of time, she meditated on the Lord's Prayer. And she would try to say her rosary, and she would try to say the prayer, but she kept getting stuck on the line. Forgive my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. Because for her, lives were at stake too. Her own, the other women who were sitting in the bathroom with her, the people that had already been slaughtered. And she was consumed by anger at those who had once been her neighbors and her friends who simply flipped because of political turmoil, because of economic turmoil, because of grabs for power, those who became a violent mob and tried to take her life. She was so angry, she couldn't pray that line. It wasn't real to her. It didn't make sense. Why should I ask to forgive those who are killing my people and want to take my life? She was stuck in anger. And it took her a long time over the course of those 91 days but at one point she had this insight as she was praying the Lord's Prayer and getting stuck on that line. As long as I want to kill them the way they want to kill me, I am burdened by the hate and the anger that are burdening them. I am caught in the same trap, and it is a trap that I can't live inside of. I'm already trapped in my body, but I'm my soul and my spirit can't be stuck here. She said she could choose between the side of violence or the side of God. And God was the God's side was the side of letting go of the violence that she was doing to herself because she continued to be angry. She was 64 pounds when she got to leave that bathroom. 
She lost half her body weight in math. Her life has changed forever. Most of her family was slaughtered. Now we listen to the story of a woman and also a nation who try to put themselves back together. And how do you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm sorry? How do we say, I'm sorry? When you think about the scale of loss and violence that has been done, how does anyone who's hurt another begin to say, I'm sorry? And it goes the way that Desmond Tutu tells us it goes. You look the other person in the eye and you see their worth and you see the pain that has been caused, whether you meant it or you didn't mean it, and you acknowledge, I hear what you have told me. I know that I caused you pain. You made it very specifically. I see and I know the damage that has been done. I cannot take away what I have done, but I can't excuse it. I see it. I acknowledge it. Here is what I am prepared to do in order to take responsibility, to change the course of events so that this can't happen again. Those that you try to say you're sorry to may not be ready to give you forgiveness because that is a separate journey and it's the other side. It may take years, it may take a lifetime, it may never fully happen. But in Rwanda they created these grass forts where there were nine trusted elders. Because there were so many people incarcerated that the national courts and the international courts that had been set up to deal with it couldn't even handle the numbers. Some people had been in jail for 10 years without even having a trial. So they set up the grass courts and people that were considered to be guilty of violence were asked to come forward. And mostly what those who had experienced violence wanted to hear was what happened to those I loved. Where were their bodies? Tell me what happened. And then if the trusted elders believed that they saw remorse, and a desire for redemption, they would bring people back into connection with their community. They would give them jobs, they would take them out of jail, and they would start to knit back together a deeply divided nation, village by village and life by life. Immaculate went to visit in jail a man that had slaughtered so many members of her family. And the guard in the prison gave her the option of kicking him and spitting on him and beating him up if, if she wanted to. He let her in, and fully expecting to see that she would take vengeance. And instead she went in and this man who had hurt her so badly and taken lives, she forgave him because she had made that journey. I'm not prescribing to anyone that you make that without going through the process of the steps of what it means to forgive someone. But what she did was when she forgave him, she released herself from the anger that she held towards him. Then he couldn't harm her anymore. And the prison guard was shocked and angered himself because she had offered forgiveness. And it took time for that prison guard to seek her out later and say that he had learned from her choice and that he too was now following the path, path of reconciliation and forgiveness. Eventually she was able to pray her way to the end of the Lord's Prayer. But when you hear the words of the Lord's Prayer, don't take them lightly because every one of them is a human experience. And sometimes it takes a while for us to be able to pray them and mean them. And sometimes we say the words, but we can't believe in them yet. She worked her way through the Lord's Prayer to the time when she could believe in every line and found her healing in the lines of that prayer and in the action of forgiveness. Now I bring you back to the life of a man who's living in the woods in a tent and sub-zero weather is coming and snow is about to happen. And there are two agencies fighting with each other. They won't talk to each other and unless they begin to communicate, the help he needs is unavailable. One of the women picked up the phone and called the other agency 
And she said, you know what? We have to get past this. We are all trying to do the same thing. And I know you guys believe in this cause as much as I do. And could we just start over? I'm sorry. I'm really confused and curious about where our miscommunication is sitting. Could we figure this out and begin again? Because there's somebody whose life is at stake if we don't talk to each other. One person in a public position swallowed her pride, looked past processes and bureaucracies and the possibility of being righteously indignant and just sticking in that position, picked up the phone and apologized to the people in the whole of their agency. And by the end of the conversation, they were all laughing. They had figured out the solution, and the person that they were trying to help had arrived to a shelter, and he had safety. Doesn't promise a perfect outcome for the person that they were helping, but they got past the things that were separating them because someone had the courage and the wisdom to start with the vulnerability of I'm sorry. But not just I'm sorry, taking responsibility, being curious, create a plan so it wouldn't continue to happen, and getting to what comes next, which was that there was forgiveness on both sides, and then they could do what they needed to do to be better people in their jobs and to protect those that were in their care. We don't know when saying I'm sorry and meaning it might make all the difference in someone's life. It can be so small, but it can lead to everything. And if you need the language for I'm sorry, it is there in confession, in the scriptures that were read to us this morning, and in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me my trespasses. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me the ways that I have failed to be the best person that I can be. Guide me to how I may be that person and help me love others and see that they too aren't always their best selves. But healing lies in this connection between us. In the I'm sorry and the apology and when it is possible in the forgiveness. But the greatest promise is that there will always be forgiveness because grace isn't up to us. When we pray, we don't pray to each other. We pray to a God that loves us more than we could ever love each other and offers grace when we are incapable of it. Know that there is always grace and love for you. And you are invited to vulnerability with each other and in the presence of the one who knows you always and loves you regardless of what you did wrong and for all that you might get right. I'm sorry.
You can find it on page 437 in the red pencil. Final song this morning is 
God for ages, verses 1 and 2, page 537, followed by a benediction. Then followed by greetings in the fellowship hall if you're able to come. Thank you. 